On this week's episode, we're going to be talking Alonso's new contract, a 2025 calendar, and of course, our first return to China since 2019. Let's go. And Stu. Hello. Hello. Um, yeah, so this week we've got a, uh, a preview. You sound so, the- <laughs> so happy to see us, Tom. <laughs> I'm just presenting, mate. Uh, that. <laughs> sorry, it's kind sorry. of my job. <laughs> just, like, just, just doing the hello. presenting yes, thing. Yes, hello. Mate. <laughs> hello, I'm here. <laughs> sorry, carry on, carry on. Oh, it's fine, it's fine. <laughs> so anyway, yeah. Um, we, there you uh, go. Bring that YouTube be- <laughs> happiness, mate. <laughs> we're going to be looking ahead to the uh, Chinese GP this week, which feels... Like quite a long time since we've been able to do scenes out the last time we were there was five years ago now, isn't it? Five years? Is that how long mm, it is? 2019. What? That's crazy. Yeah. <laughs> Point in time and like Hamilton was on like a however many win streak and everybody championship streak and stuff. A lot has changed since then. What a difference half a decade makes. Well, yeah, we know <laughs> that way, I suppose. Yeah. Um, yeah, we've also got some other bits of news from around the paddock. So um, like I led into at the beginning, we've got Alonso's new contract. So uh, Chris, do you want to kick us off there? Yeah. Um, a driver will probably be there in another half a decade, the way Alonso is going. <laughs> yeah. um, for now, he signed another two-year deal at Aston Martin. Keeps him there till the end of 2026, which I suppose, given that that's the first year of the uh, new regulations, is no accident that he's sticking around to see what they're like, I suppose. Yeah. Um, I mean, he said retirement was never even an option. It was more just a case of where he's going to be driving. It does mean that by midway through the 2026 season, he'll become the oldest F1 driver since Graham Hill. Wow. Which wow. Is, That's yeah, kind of crazy. A um, lot of like interesting stuff around this, though. Because um, I think well, we, we can be pretty sure he's had conversations with Red Bull, which I think is true of most drivers on the grid. Um, I don't think realistically Red Bull ever really wanted a driver like Alonso. We know he was on mercedes shopping list as well he's had conversations with them but um yeah he's opted to stay put um so i suppose as a starting point that is an insight into fernando alonso's review of what mercedes have been able to show him for the next couple of years i suppose like maybe at the very least they've not been able to show him anything that makes him think they can do anything better for him than Aston Martin can in the next couple of years. Well, yeah, and it tells you all you need to know about the Mercedes engine, I think. That's what we were saying the other day, wasn't it, Chris? Yeah. I've said before that the Honda engine is, I think it's the fastest, and I think it's it's definitely the most reliable. They've been more or less flawless for the last, well, as long as Verstappen's been winning championships. Um, And the Mercedes just doesn't seem to be as quick, is it? And if you're Fernando Alonso and you know you've got the best engine coming with the team that you're already with, and there's even talk of sort of them trying to poach uh, Adrian Newey from from Red Bull, then I think that's enough to make you want to stay. I don't think Mercedes uh, have got enough to 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 draw him out of the the, the, the Aston Martin circle. Yeah. yeah, I mean, there's a good point just come up in chat from Sarah. Like, it could well be as well that Mercedes were maybe only willing to offer him that one year deal. And he wants the longevity to see himself like pretty much guaranteed a seat for the new regs. Whereas, yeah, if he if he went for one season at Burke and it didn't work out for some reason, he's then struggling to find a seat for that. Yeah, so. I think that's a factor, and I think that's I think that's going to prove to be a real problem for Mercedes that mm. they've got a driver waiting in the wings they want to put in a seat but they're going to struggle to find someone who will be happy to sign a one-year deal knowing they're keeping the seat warm for a 18-year-old. Yeah. Um, yeah. Going back to the engine thing, it's interesting as well against the backdrop of the last time Alonso drove, drove with a Honda engine and how much <laughs> of a just all-around disaster that was. Um, and for now, that's a 
clearly be a big factor in his choice now is the fact that it's with Honda engines just shows how much things have changed and how much Honda have turned things around since then. Yeah. yeah. Totally. G- um, GP2 engine days. That, yeah, I mean, th- those days are long gone, aren't they? Mm-hmm. I, I don't know why, but that's just completely weirdly reminded me of uh, Lance Stroll in the Japanese GP the other week. Did you hear his radio when he was struggling on the straights? It was oh, like... a bit of a GP yeah. moment, didn't Yeah, they? he was basically like, uh, there's just no power on the straight. But it's like his voice was so <laughs> animated and it was... It just like randomly popped it because you said the GP2 engine thing, and yeah. I think on commentary they made a comment of that's Lance's own version of the uh, the previous formula. Yeah, awesome. <laughs> totally. Like, In and the I same do, place did, as well. I heard that, and it did make me wonder, like, what sort of NDAs some of the drivers must have signed <laughs> for Mercedes who are who are driving <laughs> Mercedes cars because that's the first time I think we've heard anyone actually. We've heard hints of it from mm-hmm. from maybe Hamilton that like he's not got enough speed on the straights, but everyone's always put it down to the car. This is the mm. first time I think that we've heard a driver complain about engine power from a Mercedes engine, mm. which again is just evidence mounting to say that this Mercedes engine just doesn't yeah. have the goods. Yeah. yeah. I think I've been pointed out in chat. He said he called it a different category. That was during his message was in Japan. Like yeah. Much more diplomatic way of putting yeah. it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Maybe that, that explains why Stroll still got a seat at Aston. Very <laughs> diplomatic. <laughs> yeah. I guess there's also a big difference between driving a customer engine or a factory engine as well. Like in all of the times that you had the Red Bull drivers complain about Renault engines, you never heard a peep from the actual Renault drivers complaining about their engines. Yeah, it's true. Yeah. Mm. The, um, I, I guess the the main complaint was the reliability in that for that though wasn't it wasn't necessarily always power it was more like the honda, the honda thing was generally power and lack mm-hmm. thereof power the and red, li- power and reliability it was both. there was an element of it for sure yeah but like the, the complaints themselves were generally focused around the, the lack of power whereas yeah. the renault situation at red bull was felt a lot more like we cannot rely on these engines especially like when you've got situations like it going pop in, I don't know, Austria, and you got all those expletives out of Max as he was trying to pull it up at the side of the road and stuff like that. Like, yeah, it, mm. it's, it felt like it, same thing for sure, but like maybe a different, um, yeah. a different cause, a different reason. Right in front of us in Hungary as well, if you remember. That was another. Yeah, that was Ricardo. That was yeah, a, yeah. That was Ricardo, oh, was that Ricardo yeah, that we saw? Yeah. yeah. That was Ricardo. Um, yeah. But yeah, this, I mean, this has a pretty big impact on what is already a very volatile driver market as well. It's sort of taken one of the top names and one of the top seats out of the mix. Um, I suppose most damningly for, I suppose Mercedes will start with, because we know for a fact Alonso was on Mercedes shopping list and that's uh, an option gone for them now. Um, and then it was also a potential spot for signs. I think it was a less likely seat for signs than a lot of the other ones. Um, like ultimately were they ever going to get rid of Lance? Probably not. And were they going to swap <laughs> one Spanish driver for another Spanish driver? Also probably not. Um, I mean, I guess we'll start with, I mean, I suppose you can cover both of them because at this point in time, do signs and mercedes meeting up in the middle seem like the best solution to that problem not for signs i don't think again it goes back to the one year problem doesn't it yeah. mercedes have got they've, they've generated themselves a problem in the sense of they've made it very clear that kim is the the guy for that seat from like 2026 onwards yeah. in, in theory they've they've been very they should have maybe kept their cards a little bit close to their chest in that regard, and then they'd probably get people still jumping at the chance to be with a manufacturer team. But the thing is, they they don't want to lose Kimi Antonelli either. That's the thing because they lost the stand. Very true. Yeah. Very true. So, um, it's finding the line. I think isn't it? maybe. Well, I don't think they could have done anything differently. To be honest, I think they if they. It's going to be, it was always going to be pretty obvious to everyone once Antonelli jumped from what European did the Verstappen hasn't he done the yeah. Verstappen jump from very, Formula E? To, very uh, oh no, it's the, the opposite, isn't same, it? But, that was Formula Three to Formula One. This is Formula 
Euro. four to F two. Yeah. So it's like a yeah. tier down on both counts. Yeah. But um I think he looking at Antonelli's track record and then people's people were gonna, you know, if he's already on Mercedes books, people are gonna draw that conclusion no matter what when you make a jump over a formula. And I think it, if he performs, which it looks that there's signs that he's, there have been signs that he's starting to progress in an F2 car already, that, you know, if, if that progression continues, then by the end of the season, I think he will win. I think he'll win a F2 race at the, as a minimum this season, Antonelli. I think there's a, there's a lot of bit of talk on the internet about, you know, people, I mean, Mercedes haters in general, just hating on the guy before he's even got to Mercedes. But um, I do think he'll win a race. And I think... Same with anyone. In that position, well, yeah, same it? with any young talent, yeah. isn't it? You heard yeah, it with yeah. Max, and you heard you've heard it with others before. That's, yeah, I think but um, the the point I'm making is he he is going to show how how good he is in F2 at some point this season. He's going to start yeah. coming good, and then if Mercedes didn't already have their hands all on him, then someone else would be trying to get in there and get yeah. him. So you know they yeah. had to they had to do it the way they've done it, and it's a small price to pay. It's only one season. Where they, you know, worst comes to worst, you might end up with a Perez in there, or you might end up with a Bottas in there, or you might end up with a Magnussen in there. Absolute worst case scenario, but that's only for a year. And if if all your eggs in the basket for twenty twenty six, then you know, don't I actually worry about hadn't it. thought of that possibility until you mentioned his name. But actually, signs going to Sauber and Bottas going back to Mercedes for one year. I don't hate yeah. that as a possibility. That Bottas is a bit work. of a swan song back <laughs> in Mercedes because, yeah. I mean, with the best will in the world, I think Bottas is, I don't know if he's got that much more to offer at this point in time. Um, Has the ship sailed? It. Has the ship sailed, I think, Chris? I think the Bottas ship might be sailing. I don't oh. think I don't think Audi are going to want him ultimately. And that's it's, it's been a roller coaster, bet, really. <laughs> Still love the guy, but um, <laughs> is that what you do if you were signed at this point in time? Take the no. Sauber to Audi risk? No, I'd try and get in a Red Bull. Mm. Mm. I think I think that's that's the only other good option, um, in in realistic terms. But I've I've been saying this since day one. I, I I think that the Sauber for Audi is the route that he will end up going, and I then just... the the the, bot, the the Hamilton situation does present that interesting possibility of Sauber and Audi keeping the existing relationship with Zhou Guan Yu, and then it actually being Bottas that goes to Mercedes to fill that seat for a year, possibly. Um, which I'd not really thought about it like that. I, I genuinely thought of it more the other way where it would be Bottas and Sainz together if it was going to happen. But um, here's, yeah. here's what Carlos Sainz needs to do this year. Carlos Sainz needs to win a world championship this season. And then Ferrari will be like, oh, actually, I think we've kept the wrong driver. I think we need <laughs> to get rid of Charles Leclerc yeah. and we'll keep Carlos Sainz because then we get to have the number one in our car. Yeah, we did have a good chuckle the other day when we were talking about the prospect of Ferrari finally winning a drivers' championship this year, and then not actually getting to put the number one on the car because I've already yeah. got rid of cars. <laughs> of course, um, you know the reality yeah. is Verstappen is going to win this world championship, but you know if if you can dream, if, yeah, you can dream, and if Ferrari's uh, you know much vaunted um, upgrade for Imola. You know, mm. brings it brings up the goods, and it and it's as good as Carlos Sainz thinks, seems to think it's going to be. Then, you know, maybe second two thirds of the season, if if the gap isn't huge at the moment, so yeah. it's not out of the question that they could be in the mix. But I think it take a lot. It take a big old upgrade and a, and a and a lot of. It's still quite a big gap for them to to close, but they have oh, yeah. solved their tire problems and. But they've they've gone away to solving their type. I think there's there's always work to do, isn't there? But you know that that they're, they're almost within touching distance of Red Bull, and I don't think it'd take a huge, huge, huge amount. But certainly much less than it's taken anyone in in the last in this sort of aero reg situation. It's a they're closer than anyone's ever been to Red Bull, 
and that gap is smaller to Red Bull than it ever has been. So in terms of Ferrari's gap, especially. So yeah, who knows? They might they might bring themselves into the mix. That um, yeah. Australia retirement has definitely just kind of helped keep things a bit more in touching distance if they yeah. do manage to... A couple more of those, a couple more retirements, the staff retirements, <laughs> keep things sticking along nicely. A couple more it, dodgy yeah. breaks. Yeah. Definitely. Um, what was I going to say? Oh, yeah, on the like signs to Red Bull thing, I still can't see Red Bull wanting that potential volatility in the team, honestly. Like, <laughs> I suppose there's enough already, isn't there? <laughs> yeah. Well, well, yeah. Like, as things currently stand, if Perez can keep up this current level of performance until mid-season, I think they'll give Perez another year, honestly. Yeah. Like right now, Perez is doing the job he's there to do. Um, Last year, he didn't make it to mid-season without that falling off. If he can do it this year, I do think they'll probably end up keeping him. But yeah. I think they, if, they're going to be desperate. I think I think uh, um, Perez is a, a tiny part of Red Bull's plans. I think they'll, they, they can replace Perez in a heartbeat. They, they're desperate oh, yeah. to keep hold of Verstappen. That's yeah, what's that's happening at Priority Red Bull. one by a long And way. when they don't have Honda engines anymore and they've got the Ford engines and there's already a bit of talk of maybe this sort of, maybe this new setup, engine setup they've got isn't quite showing the numbers that they want it to show yet. You know, there are rumours of Verstappen disappearing, going, going and doing something else. So, even though he's got that long, long contract, like if he doesn't like what he's getting, there'll be all kinds of release clauses in there and stuff yeah. that if, you know, if, if the performance isn't there, then he can go. And, you know, you can't blame the guy if, if, if he sees an opportunity in another team that is, and suddenly they find themselves, Red Bull find themselves on the back foot and there's someone beating them, then, you know, why wouldn't you try and get a seat at the faster team? I mean, Lewis Hamilton for next year has proven that all the goodwill towards a team in the world doesn't trump wanting to be in the place you think is going to give you the best results. And also, yeah, we're giving you the championships. Or, or yeah, the race ultimately, wins. Verstappen's yeah. going to look out for Verstappen first. Like, no doubt. Yeah, totally. And Definitely. of course, he does. He's, you know, he's a Formula One driver, absolutely well within his rights wouldn't expect to do that. You wouldn't expect anything less. Yeah. In fact, if he didn't, then you'd question what the hell he's even doing. Yeah. Well, yeah. <laughs> there is that. <laughs> Definitely. Um, We'll have a quick look at the 2025 calendar, which has been confirmed very early in the year, actually. It normally <laughs> yeah, it takes a lot longer. It, it? it feels like we're barely into 2024 and we've got a 2025 calendar. <laughs> um, it's 24 races again. In terms of the actual races, I think it's exactly the same 24, I think I'm right in saying. Uh, it's just the order that's been just shuffled around. order, yeah, pretty much. <clears throat> um, there's sort of try to lean more into the like geographic grouping thing that I've been saying they'll do. And... They have done a better job than they have for a long time. Still some weird choices, yeah. but um, I most notably, season starting in Australia again. And as yeah. someone who started off watching F1 in the 90s, that just feels right. Like yeah, Australia should first. be Australia. Like even now, like I don't really, I don't get that proper like, oh, the season started feeling until they're in Australia. Like the first race or two always seems like a bit of a... It's like testing almost. Yeah. It? Mm. Be of a dress rehearsal. Yeah. Um, um, yeah, I like it. I think, yeah, I mean, we said it. We all said it, I think, this this uh, this season. But it's only, it's, you know, they've only been starting it in Bahrain, I think, since 2020, since COVID. Because Australia, obviously, that was, that was going to be the first race in 2020. And then they showed up yes, in 2020 for the first race of the season and then went home because COVID happened and it was an absolute disaster. And it wasn't until, you know, much later in the year that we even got a Formula One race. Mm. um understandably um and yeah since then they seem to somehow Bahrain managed to hijack the first race of the season just through virtue of the fact that they were going testing there before it seems like through virtue of the fact that they were just going testing there before um before yeah the start of the season it's so a purely I, I logistical get, decision yeah I, and I get the logic of that like it makes sense but I think really as a as a curtain raiser Bahrain just hasn't really delivered the goods for me. Australia's got a, a much better, more fan-oriented vibe. Yeah, like it definitely. feels like a more of a festival, whereas Bahrain just feels like they're in the middle of the desert, middle of nowhere, running around the track, you know. So yeah, I'm glad it's I'm glad they've done that. I'm glad they've started with Australia again. Um yeah, so just quickly run through it. Uh starting Australia, followed by China and Japan getting even earlier in the season. Um 
Is this just the Chris Names Countries podcast? Is this what we're going to, is this what's going to happen here? All right. So those three together sort of make sense. Then Bahrain, Saudi Arabia sort of makes sense. Then off to Miami. Sure. Sure. Then the usual um, European run, Imola, Monaco, Barcelona. Then the usual thing of, oh, we'll just pop to Canada for a weekend and then pop back to Europe. Um, Austria, Silverstone, Spa, Budapest, Sanford, Monza, Baku. Singapore is a bit of a weird one on its own again. And then to finish the season, it's Austin, Mexico, uh, Sao Paulo, Vegas, then back to the Middle East for La Salle and still finishing the season in Abu Dhabi because I think Abu Dhabi pay an extraordinary amount of money to have the privilege of being the last race of the season. And that's if not they want to do that, if they, if they want to pay not, all their money. Yeah. <laughs> There's nothing that delights me more than when uh, the season's wrapped up a couple of races early. Yeah, exactly. Just, just like, what are they really <laughs> paying for? <laughs> it makes a couple of like dull races sort of from a championship perspective, but it it gives me a little sort of tinge of happiness or whatever. That, that I know they, they've paid so much to get the final race. All they're really paying for is that they're the only race of the season where you get some donuts. That's all they're really getting out <laughs> of their money. <laughs> Literally, for some reason, when you said that, I was thinking... Why can't you have donuts at the other race? For? Banned. Banned. The whole paddock can't have no, donuts. No donuts. No donut vendors. The day all. I see a Formula One driver eat a donut is the day. <laughs> yeah, I, I, they are I don't, the, one of the most unhealthy foods you can I get. I don't care about them eating the donuts. It's me yeah. there. I, want the, I don't want to eat the donuts. Oh, mate, so I well. love a donut. I love a donut. I, I, that, donuts are one of the reasons I'm not going to fit into my trousers for my wedding. But anyway, that's a whole other story. <laughs> um, <clears throat> um, shall we move on? Yeah, yeah I know rules. you guys spoke quite at length about the 2026 rules um, the other week. So we won't go too deep into this. But there has been in the last week a couple of stories around sort of um, basically teams have been given a lot of data and models and stuff to do a bunch of testing. The FYI are kind of working in conjunction with the teams on these rules, which makes a lot of sense. Like they're the smart ones. They've got the the CFD, the wind tunnels and all that business. Um, and there's been some real issues with these active aero plans that you guys talked about with the movable front and rear wings. Um, basically the testing, uh, showed that in the lowest downforce config, the cars were basically undrivable, like spinning out under power in a straight line, <laughs> the, the, even the slightest fast curve, just spinning out, um, Apparently, the shift in the aero balance is three times bigger than current DRS causes. Wow. So it's no wonder it's um, causing some issues. Um, yeah. One report even said that the issues were so bad in order to drive in a way that kept the car on the track, they were putting in lap times slower than current Formula 2. So <laughs> a mm. bit of back to the drawing board on the active aero stuff. Um as I say, at least the FIA seems to be working with the teams on this. They're generating yeah. this data. They're having back and forth. Like I know a couple of team principals have said, like, yes, there's problems, but we're confident that things are moving in the right direction. At yeah. least they. Um, so, like, I've, heard, I've already heard that one of the solutions to this is actually take to a lot of the aero balance was just coming off the rear of the car and that not really any coming off the front. So the front was getting loads of downforce, getting pulled down to the ground, but the rear is obviously just getting tipped tipped up kind of thing yeah when that happens so they're talking about shifting that balance a little bit more and making it so that the front of the car loses more down like make it more of a 50 50 um way of of losing that downforce to increase the speed to make the you know add add the uh aero efficiency to the car um which makes sense i think that is a solution that that'll probably they they will work it out that you know they're not daft i think yeah with stuff like this, you have to be wary about who's making these kinds of comments as well. I think if one particular team sees something they don't like in the wind tunnel, they're probably going to be the one to shout about it the most because they yeah, haven't quite yeah. figured it out yet. I've got the teams agenda. that have figured it out and do think that they can do, you know, you're not going to hear from a team that's doing really, really fast lap times. You know, they'll just stay quiet and then they'll mm-hmm. see. Yeah, exactly. See what happens. It's the teams that haven't got a solution who are going to scream the loudest about how yeah. how uh, bad this is going to be for formula one and therefore themselves yeah, yeah. exactly um there's some interesting comments from adrian new as well around the new engines um as you guys talked about there's the sort of 50 50 
power split now between the electrically powered motors yeah. and the internal combustion engine. Um, Adrian Newey said it's going to be a quote strange formula because <laughs> there's going to be times where the internal combustion engine will be getting used as a power generator. generator to recharge the batteries rather than be actually driving the wheels. So he said, as an example, it's entirely possible that you'll see cars going around the lowest hairpin at Monaco, the slowest corner on the entire calendar with the internal combustion engine going flat out because it's generating power to put into the battery, <laughs> which is interesting. Bizarre. Yeah. Like yeah. they're, Oh, that's this, such a str- just like, I'm trying to like play that in my head as like, I'm trying clip. to work out what it'd sound like. It'd so. sound crazy. Cause you've got them yeah. just going really slowly around the corner, just the absolute flat chat. That's Screaming, so bizarre. Yeah. That's That'd be a horrible be s- sound. That would sound rubbish well, as well. It sounds pretty crowd, awful. That sounds awful. Yeah. And it's gotta be tough. I mean, I get the drivers don't rely on the engine sound to change gear. Like they have, they have rev lights, yeah. they have um, beeps in their ears to basically tell yeah. them the the main thing. But at the same time, like every other car you've ever driven, you get used to this is the pitch the engine makes, and yeah. that's roughly the pitch at the way you change gear. So mm. to have the engine just doing something completely detached almost from what you're doing in the cockpit sounds very strange sounds weird, well, there's the, there'll still be the gearbox sound though that that's you tune in to just the sound of the gearbox yeah that's and true you, that's gearbox. what you'd be using as your audible reference to to know when to change yeah. gear the, the, everything else the brain is really good actually especially for a formula one driver yeah. they can tune their brains into whatever sound they need to to get the get the gear change so i wouldn't worry too much about that but um it is a strange it does sound like a strange situation. I, I, again, though, I'm sure, you know, a lot of this is probably Adrian Newey seeing what Red Bull have got going on in their own engine department <laughs> and the, the relationship with Ford. And again, if, if you know, he's he's kind of giving away the game a little bit there. He's saying that our power unit as it stands for 2026, is it, won't, it's basically telling it's giving the whole game away to every other team like this is where we're at and it's he either was... a very clever game is playing or he's sort of accidentally given something away and i don't think adrian new is the kind of bloke who's going to no. accidentally give things away so he must I be confident that that is just how they're going to be to say something like that yeah. like <clears throat> he must be confident that that's just how they're going to be for every i mean he could be wrong but he could you know he could be he's wrong. not wrong he... very often it's rare he's well. It's rare, rare that he's wrong about. Yeah, you're right. It's rare that Adrian Newey is wrong about things around race car design, but it's possible. You know, yeah, that y- yeah. you've got to have every every possible um, piece on the board in front of you, and it's possible that Adrian Newey doesn't have all the pieces of the board in front of him right now because these engines are still kind of you know they haven't really set everything in stone for it yet. And it's still getting late in the day as well. It is getting very late in the day. Yeah, I'm, I'm getting increasingly concerned about these 2026 rules, to be honest. Like, when you think about the, what was it, 2014, when they first introduced the turbo hybrids, like, mm, yeah. we knew about that engine formula for years in advance of it. Like, but, Mercedes' whole thing was, we know what these are going to be, and they just worked on perfecting that like that was that was the mercedes plan back then there's an issue with that though because because mercedes were working on it for so long they managed to steal a march and everyone else and that led to that period of dominance for mercedes they're the best engine for such a long time and what they're i think what they're trying to do is stop people developing too soon so that it's more of a level playing field for everyone Mm -hmm. um you know if everyone's starting at the same point then you kind of you know, it's then, it, I think it's a much, if you start, if you've all got to run a hundred meters and you all start at the same time, then that's fair enough. If the starting gun goes off and you don't have time to start at your hundred meter run and, you know, until sort of 10 seconds after everyone else has started their run, then the race is all but over, isn't it? I think, I guess my concern with the 2026 rules is there's this whole 50, 50 power split thing, which is like great i'm all for it that's the way the world's going you know make the sport greener more road relevant whatever it sort of feels a bit like they came up with that number first and then said okay what rules can we write to make the cars fit that rather than say 
we want to make the cars have a sort of better split of electric and power unit what can we make that will still be a good engine for the sport and also has some nice numbers we can quote and it feels a little bit like they've done those things the wrong way around maybe yeah come up with a number then try to work out how to hit it rather than going how could we improve these engines trying to hit a predefined target that's not necessarily going to actually be a good race car engine or instead of posing it as a question of how can we better utilize the electric battery part of this Mm. power unit they've instead gone how do we get it to 50 50 yeah well it, it just feels like that typical formula one sort of halfway house kind of contrived way of achieving a goal to me yes you know like they, they always do this when, whenever they mess with the rules whenever they sort of change when they're trying to train, change qualifying and stuff or with all these different iterations of sprint races that everyone apparently loves but no one ever asks for or, or wants um it, everything's always so contrived they're always sort of like bending over backwards to fit this agenda that they just seem to have come up with all on their own and it's like Come. You can see someone in like in in the meeting room being like, uh, "Oh yeah, let's do that." Like fifty fifty is a good number, right? and all the people on the engineering and rule making side have been like, "Okay, yeah, we'll go and have a look at what's possible." It's like, "No, it's all right." Press releases already gone out fifty fifty yeah. years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I see. Like somebody's come up with the idea, and someone said, "Okay, we'll go like look at how we make that possible." And someone's gone, "Oh well, I've already told the press." Yeah, like and really, what, it too premature. They're overcomplicating it, and really, what they should be doing, I think is concentrating more on like what makes Formula One entertaining and what makes it good. Mm. And I think one of the best, and this this comes, I was reading, we mentioned it, we met, we've been talking about Adrian Newey. I was reading an article, this links really nice actually into the article I was reading about. Um, and it's about how he sees the perfect sort of situation for Formula One going forward. And I won't, you know, I won't... Um, read the article verbatim or anything like that but the upshot of it is essentially it's the colin chapman approach of simplify and add lightness yeah you know he's saying the cars are way too big they're way too heavy and they're way too complicated and there's an there is an argument now you won't hear me say this that often but there is an argument to say a high powered combustion engine could be a solution because it's lightweight and it allows them it would allow them to make the cars much 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 smaller and you can actually run a you know an internal combustion engine much much more efficiently now than you could in years gone by and also you know the argument that it would make the sport un environmentally friendly is kind of silly because the amount of fuel it uses is you know the the carbon footprint that formula 1 causes is not from the cars going around the track it's from yeah. no exactly all of the logistics around hosting a formula one race and getting the cars to where they need to be and also even if the cars do have especially efficient engines and you know run on electricity or use hydrogen whatever that energy has still got to come from somewhere so it's about how you what's the most efficient way of generating the energy that a formula one car can use and there's an argument to say that a petrol powered formula one engine for the sport is a much more efficient way and a cheaper way for everyone of of running the sport and it also makes it could make for much much better entertainment i mean given that they are you know the icu element they're making engines that are 50 percent plus thermally efficient these days there is an increasing argument that with a turbo yeah with a turbo there's an increasing argument that like if you can get a biofuel or a synthetic fuel that's going to do the business, yeah. just stick that in a V8 or a V10. Yeah. And is that going to I be mean, that much worse? Yeah. I, I read a thing recently discussing this, and I think, going back to what you said, Stu, like in terms of emissions, I think the actual cars running on track was something like 0.6 or 0.7 of a percent of minuscule. the emissions of Formula One as an entity. Yeah. Like, yeah. it's... It's headlines, isn't it? It's 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 nice nice marketing stuff at the end yeah, of the day. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, you took my summary of that out of my mouth. To be fair, there, Chris, because <laughs> I was going to say, if the if that is the the end goal, instead of throwing these numbers 
like throwing some numbers on a dartboard, essentially seeing which you hit and going, let's go for that, <laughs> which is what <laughs> yeah. it feels like they're doing it at the minute. It does feel like that. Yeah. It's, it's more like a, a, an actual effort to better improve a new form of, well, not a new form of technology, but do you know what I mean? Like, an act formula, meaningful formula change. One, like, yeah. For, yeah. Formula One sees itself as a, as a sport, as the instigator of change in mechanical engineering and the motor industry, generally speaking. And d- yes, not everything that starts in Formula One ends up in a road car, but a heck of a lot of it does. And if there's ever a place to try and push these manufacturers to to make like high performance, like essentially partner with fuel partners and get the best high performance synthetic fuels, this is the end. This is like the series to do it in, realistically, isn't it? And yeah. I think if you tell if you turned around and told a team they could go back to a V8 or a V10 engine, and the only caveat was you must use synthetic fuels. I wouldn't be surprised if a lot of them jumped at the chance. To be totally honest with you, just just to re just to simplify it a little bit, because obviously you've got so much going on when you are going hybrid. Like you've got essentially at least two power source of in terms of two units to deal with you've got all the recovery systems to deal with like there's just so many added points where i'm not saying a a, v, a high performance v8 engine is simple by any stretch of the imagination but it's simpler than I think, a v6 yeah, when turbo you com- hybrid yeah when you, you compare all it, the factors yeah when you compare mm. it to what they've currently got it's immensely yeah. simple it's you know yeah. it, it, it's simple on the level of anyone Pretty much anyone could go grab a crate LS8 and <laughs> throw it in the back of anything and make it look. It might not go as fast as a Formula One car, but you know <laughs> they're simple enough that they they'll run on anything as well. They're crazy, yeah. crazy, crazy robust engines. And you know, uh, you, you want to talk about like you know marketing boons and stuff. How good would it be for you know, let's say Shell to be yeah, able to say to be. We are we are the company that powered the first synthetically fueled yeah. Formula One World Championship. You, Come buy our synthetic fuel next time you go to the petrol do station. Do you like, think? Yeah, and pay more for it than you do at any other petrol station. While you're probably. Right. Yeah. <laughs> do you think that if let's just say for one minute the FIA Formula One whoever whoever would like be the catalyst in that decision, I guess. But let's say that decision is made. There's something that comes in that says like from, I don't know. We're gonna we're gonna do these engines that we've planned for twenty twenty six. We're gonna run them till twenty thirty. And in twenty thirty, that's the plan. Like fully synthetic fuels, back to a V eight engine, for example. Do you think that they would allow multiple fuel partners with each team, like what we currently have, or do you think we'd end up a la Pirelli with a single supplier to even it across the board because part of me would actually be mm. quite excited to see like fuel wars like we used to have tire wars in the sense of but we already have that competing. we already have fuel wars really no 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 that's what i'm saying so would they continue to allow that or would we end up in a situation where you get bridgestone pirelli like th- there's just a sole think... supplier at some point so how no, quickly would you I, get i think that would be a step in the wrong direction for me go on yeah, chris sorry yeah. I say, I think financially as well, you'd have to keep multiple suppliers because they pump so much money into the teams. Like, yeah, yeah. Here's... Tronus pay huge amounts of money towards Mercedes. Yeah. Same as Shell with Ferrari, yeah. isn't it? Yeah, there's a lot of oil money going into Formula One. I think that's, and I think that's part of the problem um, at the moment. Mm. I think, you know, I think the regulations for me, especially around engines, are, are far too tight and have been far, far, far too tight for a long, long time. I think we're at a, we're at a point in technological advances across across energy use in motorized vehicles that you could open up the rule book carte blanche and say mm. whoever can get whoever can make the fastest efficient most efficient engine that will get a car around you know any any track around the specific number of laps that we've got just go for it whoever can make the best engine then you know, you're going to win races. And these, you know, these teams are all smart enough that they'll all, they'll all come up with all kinds of manners of of uh, powering their Formula One cars mm. and in all kinds of exotic ways that you, we can't even think of here. 
and that people you know will not have even thought of the research and the development of technology that would happen if they did that would be a quantum leap ahead of any v10 or v8 or, or hybrid that we've got now you know like you've got thing you've got all kinds of advancements in in combustion combustion engines even so yeah yeah i think open it up let them run whatever fuel they want if they want to run hydrogen fuel cells let them get on the guy if they want to produce an electric vehicle let them get on with it make it more like pike's peak where you can just literally sh- race what you brought show up with like the fastest car and win races i mean that's where we used to be once upon a time didn't it i know it's a long time since yeah. those days but like 70s that, 60s that was pretty the, there was a there was a time i mean obviously <laughs> not even like we were alive for this is that long ago but <laughs> there was a time once upon a time where the rules were basically your car must be open wheeled, your car must be open cockpit, go. That was, I mean, I'm oversimplifying, yeah. but that was basically it. And it's, I think you'd have a weight limit still. I think you'd probably yeah, say probably, your car has yeah. to weigh less than, less, you yeah. has to, you, can, you can't, you can't, less than this must weigh at this. least, you can't yeah. must weigh at least X amount. Yeah. But um, I think beyond that, I think that gives them some restriction and makes it so that they've got to, you know, they can't just, go and make a huge internal combustion engine and just fill it f- full mm-hmm. of fuel and just make it faster than anything, you know, make it 10,000 horsepower <laughs> and just send it down the straights like a rocket. Away you but, go. Um, yeah, I think, you know, open it up. It's, it's due a real sort of paradigm shift and reset. And obviously they're scared to death of it because a lot of, a lot of what's uh, – a lot of what's happening in formula one is around sponsors and, 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 you know, money, money talks in formula one and the people who are pulling the strings are all, so, you know, they will be lobbied by the sponsors and and all that kind of thing. They want to take care of the people who are taking them, which is totally understandable. But I think from a fan perspective, it might not sound, maybe some people would say this isn't formula one, but you know, formula one was born out of make the fastest car and race what you brought. And I think in, when we when we're getting towards what however many what 70 80 years now nearly of formula 1 there's got to be a there's got to come a point where you go for a complete reset and you say technology has progressed so much in the 100 years say that we, obviously it's not 100 years but since we started racing cars then it's time to race what you brought again it's time to come up with the absolute fastest car you can you can come up with yeah. and take the brakes off and send it. Yeah. yeah. I mean, the definition of what formula one is, is a very a constantly changing thing. So, mm. so yeah, yeah. Intr- I'm sure we'll get lots of, maybe we'll get loads of comments. Maybe people think I'm talking nonsense, but I, mean, I would just love to see people this go- kind of stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Like- yeah. yeah. I, I just find it interesting that we started talking about the 2026 rule set and we've basically developed the 2030 rule set as a vibe, as a yeah. as an well end this is more like the 2050 rule set I think we're getting towards here but yeah 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 we yeah. don't need it that far down the line we'll have it sooner than that <laughs> um, let's drag things kicking and screaming back to well to next year we'll go as far as next year um, a brief one but an interesting one um, Suprema who have been in making feeder series cars for many many years now um back back to like gp2 and gp3 days have announced they're going to be entering indycar from uh next year with a two-car team um which i think is interesting if for no other reason than so many formula one drivers have come through uh their ranks and so many other drivers have had success with them and then not made it to formula one because it's such a difficult step up so it's an interesting new route for these sort of drivers to go. Like you look at, um, I don't know who've we had in recent years, like, uh, a Schwartzman or a, uh, Drogovic, you know, these guys who've had so much success in the feeder series and they just, they just get stuck in test driver roles. So or they go to formula E or they go to formula E. Yeah. So it's nice to have sort of a, another route kind of still within those feeder series team world for them to go. Um, yeah, uh, yeah, it's uh, it's obviously not what they would ideally want, but it's yeah. Everyone wants to, everyone yeah. in Formula Two wants to progress to Formula One, don't they? I think if you yeah. suddenly end up in Formula Two and you're Formula sorry in IndyCar and you're a Formula Two driver, I think deep down you'd see that as 
a you wouldn't feel like you're getting what you wanted out of your career i think but yeah it is a it, you don't see many IndyCar drivers moving into Formula One, do you? It kind of becomes its own thing, and it's a bit of a stock yeah, yeah. series. So it's interesting news. It gives an extra option for, for I guess, for Prima drivers going. It gives it puts them on the radar and yeah. makes it possible for you to get up to mm-hmm. Formula to, to Indy Car as a maybe a placeholder. But I just don't think the competition in IndyCar compared to Formula Two and compared to Formula One is is enough to keep them sharp enough i think i'd still rather go to like super formula or maybe even formula e even though it's formula is just an absolute lottery but and the driving yeah. standards in formula e are appalling so at least they get at least yeah. going to indycar you'd at least get a decent driving standards and you know a bit more respect between drivers yeah so, yeah which is saying something just, just <laughs> if you don't get any respect out of the fia if you're in indycar <laughs> well that's it they won't yeah that's the problem they fall you'd fall that's off the, the formula one radar is the concern yeah. isn't it so yeah. The afterthought that is. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Anyway. Should we move on to some storylines after that, gents? Yes. Yeah. So, okay. First one. Um, we have a sprint weekend this weekend, first one of the season. Um, it's also a track we've not been to in many, many years, as we've said, like five years ongoing. Um, I mean, this partial resurfacing, um, albeit they've tried to eliminate some bumps so that you know there's there's good intentions there but um yeah five years we all know that like... when they whenever they try to eliminate bumps it just means that the bump they don't eliminate bumps bumps just move yeah they move yeah. Them. <laughs> that that or the i uh, the circuit just becomes like ice and it's just a slick thing yeah. that no yeah. one can get grip on um but yeah i mean it's it we don't we genuinely don't know how it will go because of that um does it feel like a good idea that it's a sprint weekend on a track we've not been to for so long and has had this resurfacing work, or do you not think it'll make much of a difference? I don't think it'll I think make it's all a, that much difference. I think it's a stupid idea. <laughs> 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 so that's covered the full gamut of answers. <laughs> yeah. Why is I it mean, a stupid idea, Chris? Yeah, go on. <laughs> um, track they've not been to in years. I only give them one practice session before they do competitive running. Um, a track that's been resurfaced might be very bumpy. I know a lot of drivers have said there's big potential for the same sort of issues that we had in Austin last year that caused the disqualifications yeah. because they're just not going to have the time to dial in their ride heights before their lot. Of, well, at least with the new sprint format, which we'll talk about a bit later on, there is more space for them to dial in the setup at yeah. least like park firm i isn't uh it reopens after the yeah, race, sprint race doesn't essentially it? um i but, think um is this is this not by design are they not doing this because they want to mix it up a bit that you know it gives possibly. gives, them, gives people the leaders an opportunity to to slip up and gives the chasing back an opportunity to compete more with or, or you know it might give your your saubers and your houses of formula one to a chance to mix it a bit more with the midfield if they can get things right and the midfield don't maybe it, that's what they're doing they're trying to make it they know like the situation it's like I, what, what's how can we I, throw banana skins at these at these teams to make things a bit different honestly i think you're giving somebody out there too much credit I was going to say, I enjoyed as your, as your, like, have they thought of all these things? The counterpoint from Discord was, or have they just not thought? Yeah. <laughs> I think I think that one could, could be, be more one, likely. Could be the other, Maybe. Honestly. Yeah, yeah, who knows? Like, am I, am I, have I just become I mean, Joe Rogan? Do I need a tinfoil on. hat? <laughs> we, we're talking about, like, this race being planned by the same people who planned to race in the Middle East during the Eid and ramadan celebration timeline yeah. like where it meant that you had to shift the whole calendar to accommodate that instead of Oops, planning around it like a normal person would so i genuinely don't think that this has been considered at all yeah. but that's just me um right another one that we've got on the list is ferrari do we think they could qualify well and give us that fight at the front that we that we're after not yet but it, it is China, need, and we haven't been there for a long time. It needs them to qualify well as a starting point, which has not necessarily been the easiest thing for them this year so far. Mm. Um, mm. I don't know if this track is going to be the one we're going to see a fight being taken to Red Bull, to be honest. I, I 
plot of straight line and high speed. <laughs> yeah. So, I You know, I can't even remember the layout of this track. I'm gonna have to go in the Formula One website. It's it. it's pretty good. Um, it's got the big snail. The big snail turn one. The big long Yeah, this, I like the turn, turn one. one. Oh, that's F1 TV. Tightens up. And then it's, you've got the you've got the fastish rights and lefts that take you out onto the back slightly banked right hander. Then you end up on the... I mean, I'm really obviously simplifying this lap, but then you've got a huge long straight, which for a long time was the longest straight in Formula 1. Don't know if it still is. I can't remember if anyone's... doesn't look like it now. now. <laughs> long um, way off. And then you've got the... Obviously, the, the pair pin at the end of that, and then the, the left back onto the start-finish straight. Mm. And there's a I lap will, around China. <laughs> I will say, quite a nice... Circuit, I hate that last corner. That last corner it's feels clumsy, like isn't it? such a sometimes. Like, oh, it's off camber, isn't it? That last corner, yeah. And it's the one Do where you, know, you always run wide and get it's the one, if I remember right, it's the one where for so many years, if you got just that little bit too far over it, it essentially, I'm going to careful how I word this, it dragged you off the circuit as you rode the curb out. It was here, and I think I feel like Malaysia was similar, but this one was worse. Where I if think, you got you know, too far out there, you got dragged off, essentially. I seem to remember them, actually. I don't know if it was here or... I don't know if it was China or Malaysia, but they repro... Excuse me, can't speak. Reprofiled the final corner to make it cambered instead of off camber to make, make it so the cars go faster. And I'm almost... I think it was Shanghai. I think it was oh, Chinese maybe. Grand Prix that they did it at. It, it might have been just around 2018-ish that they did it. Um so I think that's a much better corner now, actually, turn 16, because it gives people the yeah. opportunity to set up and overtake into turn one and to get DRS going and stuff like that, get close yeah, to that's the car, true. car ahead. Um, I'm almost that's certain right. they've done that. Or they've at least like incre- they've made it at least so it's level and not off camber, which yeah. is important. Um, yeah, it, I don't hate this circuit, actually. I think it's one of the circuits I've driven most on Formula one game in 2010 yeah. because that was just it was an early early circuit yeah yeah and just, you know i never actually i don't think i ever completed an entire season on that game but i remember doing a lot of laps around mm. shanghai and enjoying it so it's definitely one of the better telcodromes i think yeah <laughs> yeah forget it's one of those <laughs> forgot about that um right any other storylines that either of you want to add to this they're the, they're the main two we bullet pointed but I mean, can, I think... can Mercedes just sort something out? You know, the, 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 mm. are the temperatures going to match what Mercedes need for their car? It sounds like the the, uh, the 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 ambient and track temperatures have a huge bearing on their performance. And will Williams have two cars there? Or not? <laughs> yeah, mm. actually, that's not a guaranteed thing yet, is it? Mm. I think the other like thing I'm finding interesting this season is that like bottom half fights, like the fight among the bottom five teams of who might nick a ninth or 10th place. Cause that's been like so close every race. So far yeah. this year. Yeah. That's well worth keeping an eye on. Yeah. Cool. All right. Cool. Right. Well, with that all being said, let's do some predictions. Um, so for those of you who are newer, uh, you can head to back at the grid.com to find out a bit more about the predictions game we play. We're essentially about to make five predictions for this weekend's race. And you can join us by doing the same on the website and, if you do and manage to get five out of five correct, you win a prize. So it's always worth entering every race. Um, and we need to be quick because we don't have much time. We do indeed. So we're going to be quite quick with this. Um, but yeah, fastest in Q3. Any takers on this one first? Uh, I'm going to go Verstappen, obviously. Going Verstappen. Chris? I keep leaning towards a Ferrari and it never quite happens. Um, so... I am going to say Verstappen this week, which probably guarantees it will be a Ferrari. I'm going to be that one of us that goes for the, <laughs> the unconventional non-Verstappen and say Sainz, the form he's been on recently. But I'm going to be boring when I follow this up with the race winner by saying that will still be Verstappen. How about Chris? What about you on the other side of this? I think for this track, I have to agree with you and say Verstappen. And Stu? Double Verstappen. Double Verstappen. First DNF. Verstappen. <laughs> Just no. go Verstappen all five. You, I yeah, mean, you yeah. can't do Finishers, that. Finishes, Verstappen. Random driver, Random driver Verstappen. Verstappen. <laughs> um, 
you know, first DNF is going to be Williams are on an absolute shaky thing. Oh, you know what? Actually, it seems like a really good time to do the the classic what you've done, Tom, the cruel oh, home that's driver so exit. Cruel. I mean, if go you want Guan to do Yuzhou. it, I'll, okay. You're, if you're going to go for it, I, it's usually my thing. But if you're going to go for it, I'll go for something slightly different. Um, I will, on that note, go for ooh Lance Stroll. Why not, Chris? Uh, I'm going to go for Magnussen. I think Magnussen. That feels like it could. could that first corner can get pretty. Gets pretty tight. Pretty quick as yeah, it gets yeah, further and further round, and you get that bit yeah. where it starts dropping off and dipping away. It's some someone in the middle getting caught yeah. up, I think. And these yeah. cars are humongous as well compared to any yeah, other compared, time we've been compared there. Compared to so, what we were racing yeah. there, 2019. Yeah. yeah, literal tankers of vehicles. So yeah. Uh, number of finishers. Um, I'll go first. I'm going to say 16. It feels safe. Anyone else? I'm going to go 18. 18 oh, I'm going to split you both. Then I go 17. Nice and simple. And our random driver for this week is Logan Sargent, which feels... 19th. Oh, fair. So Stu has him DNFing at some point, just not first. Um, Chris, anything from you? I'm going to have him not DNFing and put him 17th. Okay. You're basically doing exactly what I've done and having him finishing... Not last, but penultimate on the road. So I'm going to go 15th because I've got 16 Probably a, an Alpine or a Sauber behind him. I'm going to assume similar. Um, so that is that. And as as I said before, if you want to head to backofthegrid.com, there's information there. Um, it will also have information there for the fantasy leagues we do. We do one on the official F1 fantasy game. We also play one through Grid Rival. You can join both of those through the website. Um with this being a sprint weekend and a bit of a new format, um, we have elected that we always we always usually qualify this at the start of Q1. Um, but because of the way the weekend plays out this weekend, we will be closing predictions at the start of the sprint qualifying. So although there's no scoring during the sprint races, that is when we'll be closing because that's when you're going to start to see yeah. effectively your real running order. So we're going to be closing it there, which if you are UK-based or are aware of GMT, that's 8.30 on Saturday Friday. morning. Friday. Friday morning. Friday morning, isn't it? Is it 8am or 8.30? 8.30. Okay. So, yes, get your predictions in ASAP. It's already open. Even if you're listening live, it's open. So go get your predictions in. And, uh, yeah, there were a lot. I should really submit my predictions this week. You should. <laughs> I should I everyone. <laughs> and I didn't submit. Did I get those points? Or, or no? I always add you in manually if I see that you've forgotten to do it, don't you? Worry? You're so kind. Thank you. Yeah, <laughs> that, that offer only applies to hosts, I'm afraid, before I start getting DMs. Oh, yeah, yeah. We can going, be doing that. There's too many people. Yeah, too yeah, many we people. Have, we have I'm going to cut that bit out. That we've chosen. <laughs> Cut it out, cut it out. Right, I'm going to move us on to inbox because we are running out of time. Is uh, keep it saying now. But stay, but stay out. Box, box, box. Hey man. <laughs> What's um, the first one. First question from Bird. Not clear if it's Sam or not. <laughs> How about each driver being allowed to pick one race where they can get double points, their home race or a specific favourite or more likely one that suits their car and driving style? So looking forward to hearing your thoughts. Thanks again for the podcast and Prediction League. Thank you for that question, Bernie Eccleston in disguise. Yeah, <laughs> literally. <laughs> Bernie, Bernie Eccleston. <laughs> I, I, I'll, I will take your double point idea and raise you. The driver can pick a hazard for each race that um, <laughs> spices things up. That could be a wet race. We could have a joker lap. Perhaps a banana skin. Some banana skin. A sh- some shells. Shell. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't know if that's Formula One. There's room in, you know, there's space in the world for that concept, but I don't think Formula One is the uh, forum <laughs> <laughs> it feels more of a Formula E or a World Rally Cross yeah, or yeah. something like that kind of thing. I don't it? hate it, yeah. but I just no. don't. I think the Formula E is something that would never happen. Another interesting, deve- like, sort of building on on the idea as well is, like, what do you think people would pick? What would Max Verstappen pick as his um, as, as his race where he could get double points? Obviously, you'd He'd pick probably... your home race, wouldn't you? 
I'd have thought he'd <sighs> or he just picked the first race because he's guaranteed to win them all anyway, and then he just hasn't got to worry about it for the rest of yeah. the season. Well, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Sarah in the chat said Williams can pick a race to have an extra chassis. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Williams. Poor uh, Williams. William. Yeah. Uh, next one is from Jason Marshall. He says, hey, guys, love the podcast. I must listen every week. Thank you, Jason Marshall. Um, as a relatively new F1 fan, I'd love to attend Silverstone this year. Can you recommend the best way to purchase tickets? Can you go through Silverstone? Or are there other sources? Um, so it feels like like Silverstone themselves have sent this question just to get a bit of a plug. Um, would you I would say to you, Silverstone.com? The best way to get Silverstone has. Yeah, the best way to get we say them. The best way to get Silverstone tickets is to go onto GitHub, set up some sort of bot, um, and also take out a huge bank loan. I mean, yeah the 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 best way to get tickets is to have a high amount of disposable income <laughs> this is the simple answer because they're not cheap. Um, as a serious answer to this question, if you weren't ever buying them direct through a circuit, like, because pretty much every circuit sells the tickets directly. I do. I don't know if you two have ever used this, but I've used um, the motorsports tickets website, which obviously don't just do F1. They do a bit of everything, but also their stuff. Some of them are like hospitality packages and, you've got like accommodation and travel and you can do all sorts of things, but I can safely say that I've used sites like that before. Like when I got our tickets for Budapest, for example, yeah. they came through that site, yeah. if I remember rightly. Like, I'm not going to tell you how I got my tickets for the majority of Formula One races <laughs> yeah, that I've been to. <laughs> but um, I believe, I think I'm right in saying for Silverstone, you can buy them through third party places, but they're going to cost you basically the same everywhere. So yeah. you might as well take the safe choice and yeah. just, Going, from the I think the only advantage of a third party generally is if you want some sort of package deal, like yeah. travel or accommodation included in it, or like a one of the VIP packages that they can offer, that kind of thing. Um, so yeah, there you go. Uh, and then last one for this week, uh, Andrea Hanna says, how do you guys like this new sprint format? Do you think it might be better now, especially with the new Park Fermi rules? And what do you think about two of them in a row with Miami coming up next? Are these good tracks for them in the first place? Um, so just to clarify quickly for people who don't know, the new format is Friday, practice one, and sprint qualifying. Saturday, the sprint race, and then Grand Prix qualifying later in the day, and then Grand Prix on Sunday uh, as normal. And I believe Park Ferme closes at the start of sprint qualifying but then reopens after the sprint race so they can make changes to set up before Grand Prix qualifying. I think if if they're going to have sprint qualifying, I think this is the way, this is finally like the the most effective way of having meaningful running on every, the, the yeah, point, the whole yeah. point of this is to have meaningful running on every day of the Formula One event. Um, if, if they're going to crack it, this is the way they're going to crack it. But I think part of the problem is it, it's just a shorter Grand Prix. It's just this. It's effectively going to be yeah. just the same as what we get yeah. in the Grand Prix. So it's kind of like a pre, almost a preview event. It's a preview um, of the first stint, isn't it? Really? Yeah. And is that bringing much to the table, or is that just going to mean that the Grand Prix is just going to be a rerun of the day before? Probably. Uh, yeah. yeah. I, I still think you'd have to tweak something about the way that you are allowed to go about setup or strategy or something for the sprints just to add that twist to them. And I think until they find something like that, it'll never truly stand out as anything other than like, yeah, like a preview of the Grand Prix itself. Yeah. Much. I think the, I still think it needs to be a re reverse championship grid race. I think that you still have your qualifying, your practice sessions on, on on a friday two practice sessions so everyone can get set up and understand ride heights and whatnot especially with these cars saturday morning <laughs> reverse no actually saturday morning qualifying saturday afternoon reverse championship grid sprint race sunday grand prix there you go sort of sort yeah. solved it mm -hmm. that way yeah. the two events are different you don't get yeah. the same I thing mean, twice I feel like we've said this every time well like, I say it every time weekend so yeah, yeah. And yeah. still haven't listened to us no, no, I still have not. 
Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, that that is it for uh, this week. So quick we, mention oh, before yeah. you wrap up. Um, if the Chinese Grand Prix is not enough for you this weekend, there's also the WEC Six Hours of Imola and the IndyCar Grand Prix of Long Beach happening uh, Sunday as well. So, yeah. Are any of those at more hospitable times for me as a British viewer? IndyCar's at 8 p.m. IndyCar's 8 p.m. That's and I think WEC mid afternoon the WEC. at 1. I Actually, can... yeah, so WEC will be finished by about 7 p.m. Got an hour to have something to eat. Pop over to Indy. Back for IndyCar. Mm. Perfect. I mean, that sounds like a good weekend, if you ask me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Coming from the Formula One podcast host. <laughs> <laughs> I know I know I'm definitely not getting up at 4 a.m. to watch a sprint race. That is a fact you can all have for free. <laughs> yeah, that's ludicrous. <laughs> that is not happening. Sorry, but it's not. <laughs> Either of you getting up? I doubt it. Heck no. no. Or are you staying up? <laughs> Also, so Stu, Stu looked like he legitimately contemplated that for a split no, second. Not, not with my parents visiting this weekend, otherwise maybe, but no. Straight Stu's through thinking, crew. Stu's thinking, can we play Helldivers until 3.30 yeah, yeah. in the morning and then just start watching the race? That or yeah, Final that's... Fantasy VII. I am loving yeah. new Final Fantasy VII. So. Anyway, this is not interesting. This is not that content is, that people care about. That is a sidetrack. Oh, you'd be surprised. Take us home, Tom. Yes. Um, if you want to get in touch with us, reach out to us in all the normal ways we're on x uh, we're on facebook and we're on instagram you can head to the website back of the grid.com which you'll have all the stuff for predictions like we talked about earlier and there's also a contact form to let us know that uh, what you what you think that way and then lastly if you are watching this through youtube please remember to like uh, and subscribe and even give it a share if you know somebody else who might be of interest um and yeah make sure you leave a comment with anything that you want to add to what we said or questions for the inbox because we do check through those as well yeah that is it for this week um enjoy the chinese grand prix however much of it you feel you are capable to get up for live if not enjoy the highlights with me (laughs) goodbye everybody thank you patrons goodbye Boom. Right. right, let's get this um, thing finished off so I can get some dinner stop. and then we can 